In Karada, Omar al-Khatib lives with his brother Ahmed and their mother and families. Twelve people live in this house. Studying is very important to Omar's daughter Farah, and the exam period in Iraqi schools has just started. The electricity cuts off regularly, so Susan al-Khatib, Omar's wife, has to switch between the municipal grid and the family's own generators. There's only electricity a few hours a day, and it's one of the family's biggest headaches. Susan has to cross the front lawn several times a day. Omar's unemployed. He worked for a food processing company which closed down last year. But his son, Azat, has access to the few things that work really well in Iraq, cell phones and the internet. The family has a monthly subscription to their own internet link. Karada is a relatively wealthy area of Baghdad, which has six million inhabitants. Most of the people in Karada used to be Christians, but the majority have now left Baghdad. The extended Al-Khatib family is pretty well off. They are Sunni Muslims and have lived here for about a hundred years. They own plots and houses all over the neighborhood, even though several were confiscated during Saddam's regime. Recently, they have acquired many new Shia Muslim neighbors, a result of the sectarian violence. Yes, because of the bad security and because of the displacement. Even here in Karada, there are militia groups working with criminal gangs. They are the real problem for the Al-Khatib family. They have no problems with the neighbors. The threats don't come from our Shia neighbors, but from the militias. Only the militias. Still, close to four years on from the war, the ration system works for all Iraqis. The Al-Khatib family owns the store close to the family house, which Omar's cousins run. Here, basic foodstuffs like rice, lentils, oil and sugar can be bought with coupons. The prices are next to nothing, and the coupons are handed out by the government. The families owe us some food stamps for the last few months, because they haven't got the ration cards for 2007 yet. Other foodstuffs can be bought in the market, the local fish delight, maskouf, for example, from the muddy waters of the Tigris River. But many families can't afford it, as well as meat, vegetables and fruit. The Al-Khatib family used to run a hair salon, which brought some money in, but they had to close it down. Some hens in the backyard produce eggs and meat, otherwise they live on a tight budget. No, we can't afford to live without ration cards, especially with no jobs and income. It's true we did have some money, but since the regime collapsed, we've spent everything. Even om släkten Al Khatib har turen att bo i ett lugnt område här i Karada, har ändå våldet i Irak drabbat dem. But the real problem right now is that Omar's brother has been kidnapped. He left the house at 3.30 p.m. and took a taxi. At 7.45 p.m. they called us and said, your son is with us and we want 200,000 US dollars. We asked them, who are you? What are you doing? And then the phone went dead. Then they called again and the man said, I want to talk to his wife. He insulted her and then asked, are you Sunni Muslim or Shia? The man called a few more times and asked which sect they belonged to and then no more calls. The ransom was well beyond the family's means and they have no idea where Omar's brother is now. We've even searched the morgues. We put his picture in leaflets near the morgue. Maybe someone will bring us his body with the victims of a bombing. But up to this point we have no information.
I wish the Americans had taken him, because then after four or five months they'd release him. This would be some consolation for a family who see kidnappings every day, even on their street. In our street there was another guy who was kidnapped. His house is on the corner. Also, two Palestinians were kidnapped. There's also another guy who was kidnapped six or seven months ago. Some of them were released after having paid a ransom. We are still waiting, as is the other guy's family. We don't want electricity, we can live without that. We just want a quiet life. I'm worried about my kids when I send them to school, like the incident in Karada a few days ago. There were many explosions and also a suicide bomber was in a minibus and blew himself up alongside the passengers. A few blocks away live Omar and Ahmed's cousins, Abdul Kalek and Walid Al Khatib. Abdul Kalek can't work anymore because it takes two men to take care of his brother Walid who was badly wounded by gunfire six months after the invasion in 2003. Some men in a car shot him one evening on his way home and he's been paralyzed ever since. I still don't know why they shot me. I don't belong to any party or organization. It's a total mystery. Abdul Kalek, their wives and cousin Bashar have to turn Walid in his bed once an hour and take care of him. The operation he should have had years ago never took place. Immediately after they shot him, he wasn't stable enough for an operation, and the doctors were afraid that he would collapse. But by the time he was in a stable condition, the doctors had left the country. Walid gets 100,000 dinars a month, around 50 euros, in disabled pension. It just helps to cover some expenses, because his medical equipment needs a constant supply of electricity. So the family keeps three generators working shifts in the backyard. My friends bring me a canister almost every day. It's a shura, a traditional Shia feast, and the family are enjoying the tradition. We eat this almost every day, especially now during a shura. Omar's other cousin, Estebrak, at least has an income. He runs a cell phone shop, but was recently robbed, and as a Sunni Muslim, suspect sectarian Shia gangs were behind it. They looked around and checked everybody's faces. And I tried to escape, but they caught me and put a pistol to my head. I told them, I'm the same sect as you, because I suspected they were from a certain militia. I quarreled with them for some time, and then they shot me in the leg and face. They shot me here. He was driven to Sada city, a Shia part of Baghdad. They were stopped at several police checkpoints, but the police did nothing because the kidnappers showed IDs proving they were members of a feared Shia militia. They carried pistols and badges. The police approached us, but they showed them the badges and the police just left. Several reports from human rights organizations claim that parts of the Iraqi police work in close cooperation with militia groups who are linked to certain sectarian parties represented in the government. This makes it hard to put an end to sectarian violence and criminality. Estebrak knew that as a Sunni Muslim, he ran a big risk of being kidnapped, 
so he prepared himself by learning to pray according to the Shia tradition. The kidnappers asked me, are you Sunni or Shia? I told them I'm a Shia, so they ordered me to pray, and I prayed. The militia was finally convinced he was one of them, and released him. So he got out alive, but he was in a bad state and had a few gunshot wounds. After what I saw, I feel sorry for the Iraqi people, because they have no hope for the future. But Susan Al-Khatib doesn't like being unemployed. She started her own NGO, Women of Mesopotamia. They have no income yet, and just five members, but at least they're working to further women's independence in patriarchal Iraq, and also to stop sectarian violence through education. I hope this will change things in this society. For if women are not educated and children are raised with sectarian views, things will continue to be bad. Thank you.